Welcome to the first of a three-session series introducing apologetics. Before we begin, we want you to be able to interact via social media. So if you don't, aren't aware, the church does have Wi-Fi. The network is Summit Drive Guest. And the password to get in is up there, 250-828-1333. So if you have Twitter especially, that will come in useful later in the evening. If you don't know what Twitter is, don't worry about it. <laughs> and people in between paper and pen are just fine. Also, we want you to know that all the slides used tonight are licensed under Creative Commons, which means that you are free to use, modify, and distribute any part of the presentation with attribution, which means as long as you give us credit. Um, you can find this presentation on my blog. It's called thinkclearly.ca. Thinkclearly.ca. And that will show up later in the presentation, too. We would love to have you visit our blog and interact with us there. And, um, yeah. So tonight's session is like uh, an Apologetics 101. And um, we're going to, uh, as we go through the evening, I'll be introducing you to but the next two sessions will be about, we're calling tonight's session, How to Be a One Dollar Apologist. Now, that does not mean that I'm teaching you how to get out of a crisis with a cheap apology. The title refers to the idea that there are a few million dollar apologists out there. They're like the rock stars of Christian theology and philosophy. Uh, the Ravi Zacharias of the world, William Lane Craig, and Greg Coco. The big names, they reach a wide audience. Um, but what we need, while they are useful and important, what we really need are a million one dollar apologists. You and me, who can do the everyday work of defending the gospel. So we'll talk tonight about why and how to be a one dollar apologist. So let's back up a little bit. What exactly does apologetics mean, or to be an apologist? Ben sort of introduced it before supper a little bit, but for those of you that are joining us, it comes from the Greek word apologia, and it means to give a defense. So if you break the word into two parts, you have apo, which means from, and logos, you're probably familiar with that word, logia. And it can mean uh, intelligent reasoning or word. So when you put it all together, it translates into a well-reasoned reply, a thought-out response that adequately addresses the issue at hand. And it supplies compelling proof. So apologetics is not a topic in and of itself. It's something that's woven throughout one's studies or your Christian life. It encompasses knowledge of God and your relationship with him, logic, critical thinking skills, theology, philosophy, science, history, psychology. It's not all of those things at once, but rather a journey of growing in knowledge and depth of insight as we explore the truths of Christianity and share them with others. Now, we've got a couple kinds of apologetics. I'm, I'm going to put this down because I, I'm looking at a mic stand instead of you guys over there. Um, so there's positive apologetics and negative apologetics. Um, positive, you can also call them offensive. And negative, you can also call them defensive. Now, it's important to understand we're not talking about emotions here. We're not talking about feelings. We're talking about well, let's use a sports analogy, okay? When you play defense, you're responding to somebody else's move. And that's exactly what defensive apologetics is. Somebody else has made a claim, and you're going to respond. Offensive apologetics is the flip side. You're not offending somebody, hopefully, but you're making a claim and backing it up. You're going on the offense, okay? We're going to do a little bit of offensive apologetics on the third week when I make a positive case 
for the resurrection of Christ. So I hope you I hope you'll join us on June twenty second for that. So let me give you a defense of apologetic for apologetics. Okay. So lots of people claim it's arguing. Apologetics is arguing. I don't want to be a combative Christian. <laughs> in response to hearing about my master's degree in apologetics, my daughter's teacher responded with his definition. Oh, yeah. Apologetics is learning how to say, I'm sorry you're going to hell in many different ways. <sighs> Ouch. Many people in the church and out of the church have a misinformed view or a bad view of apologetics. And if they've heard the word, they understand it as arguing. This is unfortunate and inaccurate and probably has more to do with the person using apologetics and the lack of tact employed rather than the field of apologetics itself. Folks, the gospel in and of itself is offensive enough. We don't want to add to that. We shouldn't be argumentative for the sake of arguing. Every Christian's job is to be an ambassador for Christ. This is what Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5.20. We want people to come to know Jesus. We all need him. Finger pointing and judging others or winning an argument about Christianity is not what apologetics is about. Loving people as Jesus loved them and steering their thoughts towards Christianity is our job. Defending the gospel with gentleness and respect. As Christians ourselves, we already know that Christianity is worth thinking about, and we want to pass that on. Okay, here's another claim. Apologetics is not going to win people to Christ. You can't reason someone into becoming a Christian. My response to that would be, this is technically true. John 6 teaches us that God alone draws people to himself. But the other fact of the matter is, is that God wants humans to be involved. He gave us the Great Commission. He chose us to be messengers and ambassadors and teachers for him. Apologetics, then, is more about method than it is about theology. It's a tool to be used in the implementation of the Great Commission. Peter tells us to use it. In 1 Peter 3.15, we find Peter uses this Greek word, apologia, when he says, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. That's in the NIV. In the ESV, it's worded a little bit more directly. It says, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense, apologia, to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. <coughs> Throughout the New Testament, we see Paul using apologetics, adapting his message to his audience to give a reason or a defense for the hope that he has. When you read through Acts, we find Paul, every city he went to, he first went to the Jewish synagogue and he reasoned from the scriptures with them to show or prove that Jesus was the promised Messiah. He went from there to the marketplace and he did the same thing with the Greeks. So whether it was Jews or Greeks, God-fearing Greeks in the Jewish synagogue, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, and that is another method of apologetics. And of course, we have the classic passage in Acts 17, where Paul actually goes to the council at the Areopagus in Athens and reasons with different types of philosophers. And if you read through that chapter, you see that Paul doesn't actually use scripture with them. He uses quotes from Epicurus, a Greek philosopher. And he steers their thoughts towards the idea, well, and the truth, of a resurrected Christ. Paul also defends the gospel from prison. Philippians 1, and then 
going to read to you a little bit of this passage. Starting at verse 3, he says, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all of my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart, and whether I am in chains or defending and confirming apologia, the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And notice this, verse 9, he says, And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, wisdom, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. He's talking about being in prison. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, rivalry but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the apologia of the gospel, the defense of the gospel. So in each case, whether it was the synagogue, the marketplace, prison, the Areopagus, Paul's message of the gospel did not change. But the method Paul used to present the gospel did. In the case for the resurrection, Gary Habermas says, you must determine, determine how to relate to the person with whom you share your faith, for it is up to you to do the work of sharing. But it is up to God to do the hard work, and we should rely on him to produce the fruit. A third claim. If you provide evidence by using apologetics, you take away the faith factor. Some people think that you should only share the gospel as well as how God changed your life or personal testimony. Now, I have no qualms with personal testimony, and in many cases, it's just what's needed. What I'm going to argue against here is when people say that that's the only method that should be used. For example, so other religious groups can claim a change in their lives or a religious experience as their testimony. While your testimony about Christ changing your life is true and genuine, a Mormon's experience can seem true and genuine to them as well. They talk about a burning in the bosom. Uh, Hindus often reach a state of nirvana. Not often, but that's what they strive for. And um, Lots of people have life-changing experiences that might have nothing to do with religion. It's not unique to Christianity. So my question to people who think that personal testimony is the only way, which is a claim that has been made, is why is the addition of personal testimony to the gospel a more inspired method than sharing evidence? If the gospel plus testimony is right, why would the gospel plus evidence be wrong? Both methods can be useful in the proper circumstance. In the end, really, neither method saves. The Holy Spirit is the one who draws people and saves. And if you are actively sharing the gospel, both testimony and evidence are useful tools in your pocket. Use the proper tool suited to the task. Okay, now I want to give you a positive or offensive apologetic for apologetics, and it shouldn't be offending. So, I think that we should use apologetics because we were given the Great Commission. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And as we saw with Paul's example, we need to adapt our method of delivery to the audience we are trying to reach. 
So you're given the Great Commission. We live in the age of information. The internet is a game changer. Everything we need or want to know is a click away. This is good and this is bad. For example, atheism alone has exploded in the last 10 to 15 years. It's just a click away on the internet. We need to be able to navigate our way through mountains of false doctrine and ideas floating around up there. You need to know what you believe and why you believe it. It takes some work, but it's not just for your sake. It's for the sake of those around you, your family, your friends, your children, maybe some profs. Access to information like this also means, really, we have no excuse to be to not be informed and equipped. We have no excuse. The gospel is the most important message that people need to So we were given the Great Commission, we live in the age of information, and we live in a post-Christian era. Many, if not most, people today don't believe the Bible to be the literal word of God anymore. That means that in conversing with people about God, evidence often has to be the place to start they need to know they can trust the Bible to be true before they will read it as the Word of God. Some may even need to explore the idea of God even existing. So, Great Commission, Age of Information, Post-Christian Era, and Jesus used reasoning and evidence, as did the Apostles. And if Jesus used it, it's probably good enough for us to use too. What do I mean by that? Well. Jesus told people, I think of John the Baptist, Martha the sister of Lazarus, to believe in him, to believe in him based on the evidence that he provided through miracles. He didn't expect blind faith from people. So, these are all great reasons to use apologetics. And I think some of the most important reason is shown in the next couple of stories that we'll tell. A former pastor of mine recently opened an apologetics conference with prayer. That was his job at the conference. The cry of his heart was that God would equip him to be able to contend with his son. His son had been baptized, grew up in a Christian home, obviously with a pastor for his father, and he was a very brilliant young man. Is this still a brilliant young man? And he recently declared to his father that he's going through a process of deconversion. In fact, strangely enough, he's getting a degree in religious studies. This pastor, a former pastor of mine, wanted the tools of apologetics in order to be able to contend with his son's questions and false information and claims that were being fed to him. Did you know that apologetics was about spiritual warfare? 2 Corinthians 10, 3-5 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging a war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. And we take every thought captive to obey Christ. How about this story? Recently, an 11-year-old boy, so that's about grade five, grade six, depending on where the birthday falls, from the lower mainland, he recently emailed this letter to his family, and I had permission to use it here. 11 years old. He says, hi, as you may know, I've almost near done Christianity, but I would like to know what you think. I've done a bit of researching myself, but I would like your opinion, so please do not work together so that will change your opinion. Thank you, I would like this done by Friday at the latest. <laughs> so here's his questions. He had eight of them. How do Christians get off saying their religion is the only one? Don't all religions lead to the same God? How can a loving God send people to hell? How do you know there is a God? How can there be a God when there is so much evil and suffering in the world? 
How can you reconcile belief in God and science, especially evolution? How can you trust the Bible? Why is God so morbidly violent in the Old Testament? So maybe this 11-year-old didn't come up with all these questions by himself. But remember what I said earlier about atheism being a click away on the internet? So maybe he had a few questions and he went digging. There's certainly a lot of material out there that he could have latched onto and other questions fed to him. How did you do? Could you have answered him? Would you have been ready to answer him? Maybe you have these questions yourself. Some of these are pretty big life questions that most of us bump up against at one time or another. Questions about God start very young. We have a young man in our congregation young man, and I mean six years old, and last year, when he was on the bus coming home, he got off the bus, and he, his dad was waiting for him, and he got off the bus, and he's just crying, and his dad says, what's wrong? Dio, what's wrong? And he says, Samuel told me there was no God, and he told me God didn't exist, and then his dad told him that God didn't exist, and I told him God did exist, and he was very impassioned, and he's crying, he's five, and he's bumping up against this. My daughter, last year in public school, had a world, relig world religion section in social studies. Probably remember taking that unit. And the teacher was very interested in Buddhism. It was a special interest of hers. Perhaps she was Buddhist herself. But they spent more time on Buddhism than any other subject, any other religion in that section. And they were to make prayer beads. They have something like a rosary. And they were to learn a Buddhist prayer and recite it in class. So what is a girl to do? My son had a morality and ethics section in his English class in grade 12. The material given was straight from an atheist website, and religion was swept aside as myth. These stories and concerns cross all age groups, socioeconomic levels. We live in a time and a place where Western Christianity is under scrutiny and attack, mostly in the realm of knowledge and belief. No, our lives are not in danger, not like our fellow brothers and sisters overseas. But our way of life, as in freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom to congregate, will not remain if we cannot contend for our beliefs and for our way of life. We need to know what we believe, why we believe it, and we should also know what others believe, and we should know how to ask and answer questions. Hey Ben, do you have those papers to come start passing them out? So, we're gonna do this, now it's time for you guys to get involved. We've done our introduction, and then you guys get to a little more. So we're going to be passing out some activities, and if you can get into groups of two or three, um, I want you to read through these little scenarios. This activity is called 10 Second Window. So in each scenario, you have a 10 second window to create an opportunity for further conversation with another individual. Okay, so discuss, read it through, and then discuss what you would do or say, and you only have 10 seconds to respond in your scenario. You've got about five minutes. So how did you do? Were you ready with the response? Could you have done it in 10 seconds to keep the window of conversation open? It's hard, isn't it? Okay, well, I did have a purpose for doing this, and it wasn't to make you feel bad. <laughs> what I want to do is show you folks that we need training in how to respond to real world situations and it's doable. Even if it didn't feel like it tonight, what I want is for you to come back next week and we're going to be talking next week about tactics and defending the faith. So, it, and actually we're going to redo this exercise next week after you've learned a couple tactics and you'll find that it's much easier and you'll be much more confident in coming up with a 10 second, in a response within the 10 second window. And it's not complicated, and you don't have to know a lot. Um, we 
You don't need tons of knowledge to be able to help people think about what they are saying. And we certainly don't need to get preachy in a car dealership. There are some people who can do that, but most of us can't. Most other people don't want us to. What we want to do is to be ambassadors for Jesus. We want to leave people thinking, and we want to leave people wanting more. We want to keep the conversation open. So next week, we'll take a look at how to do just that, and we'll explore how to ask the right questions. It's a simple skill, it's easy to learn, and it has a powerful effect. Okay, so how to be a $1 apologist? Now that we know what apologetics is, I'm gonna have to tell you another story. It takes place in an average Canadian city, a blue collar mining town that has, a, that has big city amenities and lots of hard working people, one local newspaper and a university. The city is also the home of a very active atheist group known as the Center for Rational Thought. Anybody know what city I'm talking about yet? Yeah. <laughs> this uh, Center for Rational Thought, they organize conferences, they maintain a website, they have a blog, and a library. We're going to call the director Mr. Atheist. He regularly writes letters to the editor, Aligning Christians usually, and he even has a weekly column entitled Rational Thoughts. The problem is, is that honestly most of his thoughts are not that rational or coherent, but they get a crime exposure. So in this same town, we have Average Joe. He's a middle class husband and father of three who attends an evangelical church and works at the local university. He's also done some reading in the areas of philosophy and logic, and was bothered by these letters in the paper by Mr. Atheist. So he decided to write letters to the editor in response. Through some of his letters, he was able to write about Christianity being rational rather than atheism, how even though religion has caused wars and death, atheism has also done this to a greater and more horrific degree. He also publicly challenged Mr. Atheist to prove his belief that there was no God. Can he prove it? He's making a claim. This average Joe also attended some of the Atheist group's events and introduced himself to the director, Mr. Atheist, afterwards. He was just doing what he could, and he was establishing a conversation, so to speak, with Mr. Atheist, and mostly anybody else who might be listening in. In 2012, the Center for Rational Thought is going to hold their second annual Imagine No Religion conference. And Atheist Alliance International was helping sponsor the event. It became a big deal. They were going to hold a debate on the Friday evening with two prominent atheists on the topic of God's existence. They needed Christian opponents. And who was the Christian they knew would take them on? Average Joe. So they contacted Average Joe and said, hey, will you debate at our conference? What an amazing opportunity for the kingdom, right? Wasn't this where his interactions with the atheists had taken him? Was God asking him to debate? In no way, however, was Average Joe experienced in public debates. He was much better on paper than on his feet in an argument. Public debating was not something he was qualified or prepared for and neither could he become so in time for this event. Okay, here's another activity. I want you to take a moment before I move on with my story to individually picture a time, so this is just a personal activity for the first bit, picture a time when you felt you were way out of your depth. There was, there was no way you could do the thing that was being asked of you, okay? Just take a couple seconds. Okay, now, you don't have to get all details and personal and whatever, but in groups of two or three, just in, you know, quick words, I want you to share those moments of inadequacy with one another. Just groups of two or three, and from your groups of two or three, pick the most compelling, okay? You have about three minutes to do that. Go. <laughs>
brave souls who will sort of call out what those were? But are you ready and equipped? 
equipped to meet your unique challenges and opportunities when they arise. You don't need to be a million dollar apologist to make a difference. So back to those moments of inadequacy that you just shared. We have all felt inadequate. If you haven't, by some miracle to this point, you probably will. Kurt Hahn of the organization Outward Bound is known for saying, your disability is your opportunity. The word disability can be a range of things, from physical illness or malformation to a situation in your life, or perhaps something that's not your area of expertise, like Hinduism or psychology, yet at that point, or public speaking. In other words, Han here, what he's trying to say is, how can you flip your thinking from, I'm inadequate for this situation, to how is this situation my opportunity? This is actually biblical thinking. For example, the Apostle Paul had what is thought to be a physical disability or infirmity. This man who had performed miracles for God and had been a missionary, he had been stoned and brought back from death or near death, pleading with God to remove this thorn in the flesh that he had. This was God's reply. My grace is sufficient for you. Power is made perfect in weakness. Paul goes on to say, Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. 2 Corinthians 12. Your disability can be your opportunity. In the mid-80s, my dad traveled to uh, communist China, and he made contact with members of the underground church. He met a little old lady who was crippled with arthritis. The picture of her, she was just twisted up, and all she could do was sit in her little apartment. It was a little box apartment, totally concrete. It was, she was viewed as fairly useless by the government, so they just left her alone. Yet she was crucial to the underground church movement. At the back of her little box apartment was a closet with a cloth curtain drawn across it. The closet was filled with Bibles and educational material for the church. Her disability was literally her opportunity. The government left her alone and she was able to provide a way station for the underground church to procure much needed literature. Let me introduce you to Daryl Davis. He's the guy on the left. Mm. He's a musician. And back in 1983, he was playing country music, think about that, in an otherwise all-white band. He struck up a conversation with someone who liked his style. Long story short, he ended up friending this man, and this man turned out to be a member of the KKK. That friendship dispelled the myths and lies about black people that the Klansmen had been brainwashed with over many years, and he ended up leaving the Klan. He was just the first in a long line of many to come. The KKK in Maryland ended up being basically dismantled because Davis kept making friends with its members and thereby dispelling their beliefs. This man's disadvantage, disability, would seemingly have been his race. Instead, he turned this into an opportunity of befriending clan members so their false ideas about his race would be dismantled. His alleged disability is his opportunity. So, what happened with Average Joe? Okay, full disclosure, Average Joe is my husband, Paul. He's up there. So I happen to know that formal debating is definitely not a part of the skill set. But he was still positioned to use this opportunity. Together, he and I had a few connections to people who could debate formally and who had the skills needed to represent the yes side in regards to the question of God's existence. So in 
So we helped connect the atheist group with those professors. Well, now we have the atheists paying the way of the Christians, so they were going to be here overnight, so why not make use of them, right? So we created our own little apologetics conference for the next day and invited out a couple other speakers. Printed postcards, hit the pavement, went and talked to everybody, all the churches in town, and said, hey, come on, let's get together and have an equipment conference, an apologetics conference. So we actually had that little apologetics conference right here in 2012. My husband and I weren't attending here yet, but um, this church opened its doors wide and said, yeah, come on in, let's do this. And we partnered with another church, and it was a great day. Oh, and by the way, those professors won the debate, hands down. That's great. Hey, not bad work, not bad work for average Joe, okay? One dollar apologist. And that's what he is. That's what Colin is, a one dollar apologist. Good in debate, didn't have a degree in the field. He did, however, take time to read about the questions that he had in regards to Christianity. Then, when the opportunity presented itself, he was faithful to write letters to the editor. He went to the public events put on by the atheist group. I, I couldn't, that was great to me. I couldn't have done that. That was scary to me, but he loved it. And he built an acquaintance type relationship with the leader, which in turn led him to be able to set up and organize this time of debate and equipping. So that's his story, but your story, it might be your vocation that is keeping you from being a one dollar apologist. But if it's your disability that's keeping you from doing something, maybe it can be your opportunity, remember? How can you change your thinking about that? Many of us hold full-time jobs, and we feel like we can't be full-time missionaries, apologists, that whole kind of thing, right? Even if you want to. So my full-time trade at the moment is a medical transcriptionist. I work at the hospital and I type reports all day long. But I would eventually like to use what I know about transcription as an illustration in regards to the accuracy of the translations and transmission of scripture. I'm also a musician, and I've been a worship leader at other churches for years. Now I want to help the church see loving God with their minds as worship as well. Another great example is this guy. J. Warner Wallace wrote Cold Case Christianity. He's a homicide detective in LA. He was an atheist till he was 35. And he decided, he was exploring Mormonism and Christianity, and he decided to apply his cold case principles to the resurrection and to scripture, and ended up becoming a believer. And he's actually the one who coined the term one dollar apologist, and I told him I was stealing it and said that was okay. But he's, he makes a point of preparing himself and using his job to be a one dollar apologist. Okay, how many of you have your phones here? Can you get out your phones or iPads? Time to use your, uh, if you have Twitter. And if you don't, grab a pen and a paper and jot it down, that's fine. Take a minute and think about what you earlier thought of as your disability or not to see your personal one. Um, and if you couldn't come up with one, then use one of the ones that were shared, okay? There's no wrong answer. I want you to think of how you can turn your disability or your inadequacy, yours, your one, to an opportunity. Just brainstorm a little bit. And if you've got Twitter, I'd like you to tweet it to Summit Drive Church. Hashtag Summit Drive Church, and it'll show up up here. Okay? <laughs> While you're working on that, I want to tell you that this presentation as well as this activity will remain on our blog at thinkclearly.ca. So you can actually find this stuff on our blog even after tonight. It's part of the reason why we didn't do a whole lot of handouts and notes, because they just get thrown out, but this will always be there. 
Okay, so we'd love to have you visit there, thinkclearly.ca. So this is a time for you to take your disability, think about what you thought of as your inadequacy. How can you turn that into an opportunity? Got any showing up here? So if you have an idea of how to make your an idea of how you have an opportunity, and you can put it into 140 characters. We'll keep that going for a little bit as I move on. Okay, so. <laughs> okay. It says. Okay, okay, I'll be second. Stand on the stage. Stand on the stage. <laughs> Auto correct. <laughs> okay, I guess we are moving on. You can try tweeting those. They There's a bit of a delay apparently. Or it's just not working. I'll throw one out. Okay. I know from Twitter, sorry. No, that's good. Everything I have commanded. And we 
We've said this before too. Peter writes to the early church, in your hearts with your Christ as Lord, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Gentleness and respect. With that in mind, bloom where you're planted. Earlier I mentioned that you are unique. Only you have the network and the social contacts that you do. Your circle of influence is different than mine. Only you can meet the certain needs and questions of those around you. You are uniquely placed in both culture and time. You have been ordained by God to live in this era, this age of information in the post-Christian world. So, how will you answer the Great Commission? There are three ways that I would suggest, and they look different for every one of you. Serve, learn, be winsome. These three things are interdependent and they're ongoing. As Christians, so the first one is serve, and as Christians, I hope you're already doing this. Serve into it. Serve the least, provide servant leadership, serve like Jesus did. If you're doing this, whether it's helping with the youth or teaching Sunday school or a small group at the university or just connecting with people at work, or maybe you're staying at home with your kids. You're in a position to make disciples. Once you are serving, then you can use the resources of apologetics in a relevant area and help those around you learn about God and learn to love God with their minds and hearts and souls. Make disciples, teaching them to obey God's word. Secondly, learn. Educate yourself. Be a lifelong learner. I like the fact that you guys are here on a Monday night when it's really hot. And I'm kind of preaching to the choir since you're spending your free time here. Let this be a launching pad for you to dig deeper. There are so many great resources out there. Just start with a question that you have. Some of the big questions of life, remember that the 11-year-old asked? Some of the big questions of life, like, does God exist? Is there evil? Why would a good God love suffering? I am sure there are many people in our congregation asking that question this week. Do all religions lead to God? Is there life after death? This is another pertinent question this week. Did Jesus really rise from the dead? Really? What questions are your kids asking you? Questions about God start at a very young age. Are you prepared? Be prepared. That's what Peter said. So, read books on your topic in question. Read material that's opposite to your point of view. That's hard. We don't like to do that. But it's important that you think critically about it. Take a course, or take several and get a certificate or degree. I just completed an MA in apologetics through Bible online. But do what you can. Maybe many of us don't have time or money to do a degree. That's fine. There are so many books, blogs out there, podcasts. Make use of them, but be deliberate about it. Come on, let's face it. Some of our biggest battles these days is with binge watching Netflix. At the same time, don't feel overwhelmed by all this. You got this. If you're not sure about the content, ask some people on staff here or email me or ask a trusted person in leadership. Networking through apologetics groups in social media is a great way to throw out questions without anybody really knowing you. Um, you can email me at thinkclearly.ca and I would love to interact with you. But be deliberate about studying. How many of you guys know who William Lane Craig is? There's a few hands. Okay, so he's like, he's one of those rock stars of apologetics, okay? So he's really smart. And he's debated people all over the world. Richard Dawkins, well, I think Richard Dawkins was too scared to actually meet with him. But this guy, he's really, really smart. And he was interviewed on his podcast, and he was sharing what he does to study. So I kind of wanted to know, so what does this guy do, right? This million-dollar apologist. He uses the turtle method. So as well as 20 minutes of Bible reading every morning, he reads two pages that take about 20 minutes of the church fathers every morning. 
ancient writings. Now, granted, he's probably reading them in Greek or Latin, but the point remains, we can read for 20 minutes a day on a relevant topic in English. Maybe it's an apologetic 101 type book. This is an excellent one to start with, Bold Case Christianity. They'll take you through the chain of evidence from how we know that the Gospels are um, true from their originals, even though we don't have originals. It's fascinating, and it's an easy read. Bold Case Christianity. Maybe just looking at a relevant blog in the morning. There's lots of good blogs out there. My point is, is that being deliberate and reading, it's doable. It's not a burden. And it doesn't have to be a long time. This guy talks about taking a theology degree while he was a homicide detective. He thought he was going to do a theology degree part-time. And then he took a look at it and figured out doing it part-time was going to take up 10 years. But then he thought, so what? 10 years are going to go by anyway. So, he may as well come out of this 10 years better able to defend his faith and knowing what he wanted to know. So those are all good examples of ideas. You can adapt one or more of them to your own life or come up with what is doable for you. That's the point I'm trying to get. Is that do something deliberately that you can do. So, so far, to be a $1 apologist, turn your disability into an opportunity, bloom where you're planted, Serve, learn, and be winsome. Watch this video. Texas Muslim Capital Day. We are honored. Thank you. We are going to 
learn how to use selective questions to invite others to participate in a conversation, make headway without making an assertion, shift the burden of proof, and put you in the driver's seat. It will give you confidence to interact. These are simply conversational skills that they can help you build your team. And by the way, you don't have to know much to show kindness and respect. Remember Daryl Davis? He dismantled the Maryland KKK by being winsome, by being a friend. I don't even know what his religious beliefs were. So I wanted to share with you some resources. Again, these are on our blog. I didn't want to hand out a bunch of paper and get it all thrown around and you get it lost. Thinkclearly.ca, that's where you will find this. There are Apologetics 101 stuff if you want to just get started. Easy books. There's some kids' resources. If you're looking for kids' resources, Jill Enns, our children's and family pastor here, she has sort of a library going. You can talk to her. She's a great resource for kids' apologetics stuff. Deep Cuts. This is if you want some tough reading in philosophy and theology. Some great deeds there. Blogs, it's a whole list, and a specific section to Canadian blogs, because you know, folks, we have our own Canadian issues, <laughs> right? Physician-assisted suicide is the most recent one. We've legalized gay marriage, but how do we talk to people about that without polarizing the issue and people not listening to us? Abortion, we have no abortion law. What do we do with that? Do we even know how to argue for pro-life stance, life being sacred. So, those are there for you. They're links. What's the website again? Thinkclearly.ca. Can you, can, Paula, can you go to the, oh no, I guess that's a PowerPoint. Can you go to the home page? Think there, thinkclearly.ca. It's all small case. The resources are under, see on the bottom, there's all those words there. He's highlighting. If you hover over Apologia, Apologetics resources are right there. If you click on that, it brings up the page you just saw. Okay, so now what? Go do something. Your brains are churning with ideas. I've told you lots of stories and given you lots of examples. How can you prepare for your opportunity? I want you to choose one thing that's doable this week. Maybe it's just reading a book. Maybe it's just ordering a book. It doesn't have to be complicated. But choose one thing that you can do to equip yourself. Be ready to give an answer for your hope. I want you to pass out those sticky notes there. I think they ended up on a couple tables. I want you to take that one thing and write it on the sticky note. If you want to use more than one sticky note, that's fine. Keep going. Oh, that would be great. One thing for sticky note. And as you leave, see there's a big round table up against the wall at the back. I want you to stick your sticky note on that table. Make a big messy collage of sticky notes. And Colin and I will put it on the blog in a collage and you can go there and see all the inspiring things that you guys are going to do this week. So, sticky notes are coming around. Write one thing you can do this week that's doable for you. Maybe it's the turtle method. Maybe it's simply ordering a book. Maybe it's starting a blog and I can add you to the list up there. I don't know, what can you do? Maybe you can pick a book of the Bible and read through it in one week. Read it several times, get into it. So to be a one dollar apologist, turn your disability into an opportunity, 
bloom where you're planted. Serve, learn, be winsome, and go do something. Average Joe, Colin's story is ongoing. My story is just beginning, and I hope that yours is too. I hope that I can be in the trenches with you guys, each of us working, where only each of us can. Let this be the impetus for you to turn your disability into an opportunity, bloom where you're planted, and to be a one dollar apologist. When I shared this with Harry Bicknell, he said, uh, make yourself available to God and you will be a one dollar apologist. And they will be some of the most exciting days on this planet. Margaret Mead once said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And like we've heard several times tonight, Jesus told us, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Thanks, guys.